I made a proposal to my professor at the time, Professor Bob Morris. Uh, you know, I, well, now I was cheating, right? I was trying to stay in the group a little longer, trying to find a more permanent job. So I said, listen, what if we make these compounds? You know, we'll have these NH moieties. You know, if you put the, the such a molecule on the hydrogen gas with a base, you're going to remove the chloride, replace it with hydrides. Now you could have these intra molecular hydrogen bonds. Maybe they can be used for catalysis and, you know, by now you realize I'm really getting carried away. Uh, so, you know, Professor Boris wouldn't buy it. He said, listen, well, if you know better, you know that compounds like this don't exist. The mechanism is not possible because, you know, he teach the catalysis course, you know, better a ligand need to dissociate for the substrate to coordinate. And, you know, it would be a waste of time and money. So, I, with his permission, I said, okay, you know what, since you won't buy the ligands, well, maybe I'll, I'll try and make them and we could test them. So we got some amino acids, we had some amino acids in the lab, and this is a process. So we converted to the amino alcohol, then the chloride, and make these amino phosphines. So these were the first set of amino acids we make, and they were made from, uh, sorry, the amino phosphines we made, they were made from amino acids. And then we bind them to the metal, we made these catalysts. So, we were able to demonstrate very quickly that these work. They're very good catalysts. They can hydrogenate ketones, amines, aldehydes, and you get the respective alcohols and amines. So a couple of years later, by 2000, we were now being in discussion with Ferminish. So Ferminish is one of the, well, in fact, Ferminish right now is the second largest fragrance and flavor company in the world. They produce a variety of fragrances. Uh, some of these fragrances are sandalwood fragrance. So, for example, this compound, Dartanol, they produce it in 500 ton per year scale. The standard process they use is sodium borohydride. So, to make 500 tons, they need 100 tons of sodium borohydride. Now, when the reaction is finished, they you know quench it with water, then quench it with acid, then they extract it, distill it, and get their product. But they also have 500 tons of boric acid waste to dispose of. So this is a process that they now use, actually using that simple, the first catalyst I made. And now they only need 50 kilograms of catalyst. They're looking at a substrate to catalyst ratio of 200,000 to 1. More efficient manufacturing, just a you know, standard hydrogenation. The solvent is too propanol. It can be recovered and recycled. The patent was filed in September 2000. And by May 2001, it was industrialized on a 500 ton per year scale. And this process is actually still in effect today, plus several other synthetic sandalwood fragrances and other fragrances, some of which I'll mention very quickly. Now, we used to call this catalyst, Kamal's catalyst, but Fermish preferred to call it the bomb. So this is another project, that some of which was done with Fermish. They produce this, uh, this, this fragrance, it's sterile acetate. So essentially, it's acetophenone, you get phenylethanol, and then you convert that to the acetate. It's an industrial fragrance. It's actually used in soaps, in cleaning products, uh, you know, floor cleaners and strippers and so on. And it's produced in the tens of thousands of ton per year scale. Now, the original process to make this is using heterogeneous catalyst, so you could use uh, nickel, uh, powdered nickel and palladium. The problem with the heterogeneous catalyst, you also get some ethyl benzene product. And if anybody here has ever smelled uh, ethyl benzene, you, you, you'll, you'll know that this is not a very good process to be making any fragrance material. Now, the problem is that they now have to distill the product several times to remove the ethyl benzene. The process we develop, we're just using our catalyst. In this case, we use a neat substrate. No solvent, so go from neat, product, neat substrate to neat product. No distillation is required. You just throw in your acetate, your copper catalyst, and you get your fragrance. We actually scale this up to a substrate to catalyst ratio of one million to one. All right, so very successful demonstration and uh, an industrialization of this technology. Now, Ferminish is also, they produce a range of fragrances, and quite a bit of these fragrances have their own brand name. Like, for example, there is this grapefruit um, fragrance, which they call Pamperwood. Uh, they make it on a hundred, sorry, on a, on a, on a one ton per year scale. It's a fine fragrance, it's very expensive. And the standard way they, they used to make it involve 
uh, you know, some boring reagent. Now, those have to be stoichiometric boring reagents, some of which have to be chiral in order to get some selectivity. Now, using this catalyst, so we're able to make it. Um, and so what is key here, and what I really want to point out, is that it's a ketone hydrogenation that's required. But within that ketone, you also have this apical double bond. This is very sensitive, all right? With the boring reagent, they also get some uh, reactions with the with this double bond. With our catalyst, it selectively reduces the ketone, leave this double bond in, intact. In addition to just simply, well, doing the reduction, they also need to get um, a ratio of what the X1 endo ratio of 60 to 40. Uh, firmness, uh, listen, that's necessary because it impart a certain radiance to the fragrance. I have no idea what they're talking about, but it works. And so this process has been scaled up. They actually use neat substrate, no solvent, and you know they're producing this on a one ton per year scale, and they have been doing this for about 15 years now. So to give an idea of what we do when we get a project, like similar to what we did with Ferminish, we do what is called a catalyst screening. So for example, if there's a desire to make this product, it's, uh, it's called woody acetate. Uh, it's a six, the cis 4 butyl cyclohexanol, uh, which is then converted to the acetate. The cis product is more valuable. Now, the transformation involves converting the ketone to the alcohol and you'd prefer to have more of the cyst than the trans. Now a typical screening process would set up a standard condition, for example, say a 1,000 to 1 substrate to catalyst ratio, and we'll look at different catalysts. So if you notice, these are all amino phosphine catalysts, but they're all different. You have the base amino phosphine, you have the cymine amino phosphine salts, and so we just do a screening, and we, you know, remember, what we're really looking for is more cyst than trans. And here, we have one that's give us 96. This is the bomb. I didn't do too well. But then once we have that success with the hit, then we do the scale up. So we go from a you know, substrate to catalyst ratio of 1,000 to 1 all the way up to a million to 1. And if you look at what happened here, you still retain that sister strands ratio. So something like this, would, the next step now would be going to commercialization. So. Another area that we looked at was the Nayori catalyst. So we were very successful with the amino phosphine system. Uh, so this was in you know the like, late 90s, so you know 98, 99. Uh, and so the Nayori catalysts were well known. I have the base phosphine, amino phosphine, uh, the diphosphine, amino phosphine. Shannon talk about some of those uh, today with her research. But at the time. These catalysts were known to be very effective for ketone hydrogenation. You could put, produce all cores, including chiral all cores, and just about any scale. We demonstrated they could be used for amines, so we were the first to be able to demonstrate that these could also be used to make chiral amines, especially for pharmaceutical application. Use hydrogen gas. The active species were not isolated, and hence the nature of the true catalysts were not known. And in fact, there was a lot of controversy at the time because of the diff there were different proposals and what the mechanism could be. So as part of our uh, what we consider a duty at the time. We want to see what, the, what these active species are because by now we are working on base amino phosphines, amino phosphine, diphosphine, and of course now the Nayori system, the diphosphine, diamine. And we're able to show that all of them have the active species as dihydride compounds. Some of those are cis dihydride, but in this case, this is a trans dihydride compound. Now, we are able to show that this molecule actually have an electrostatic interaction between the hydride and the proton. So the same concept we had outlined at the very beginning, we're able to crystallize this compound and show that it is indeed real. Not only is it real from an uh, electrostatic perspective being in proximity, it was also real in terms of reactivity. So this solid will spontaneously lose hydrogen in the solid state. Or if you put it on the inert gas like argon or nitrogen or on the vacuum, you could spontaneously lose hydrogen from this compound. And of course, you could put a solid. Now, you go from a yellow solid dihydride to a purple amido compound. And you put that purple amido compound solid on the hydrogen, and you get back your dihydride. So it's a clear indication that this system was very active, both in the solid state and in solution. Now, what would happen is that if you now put some, a, some ketone or imine in contact with that dihydride, you, you essentially get stoichiometric reduction. You get the alcohol amine product, and you also get that purple amida compound, all right? Just a one-to-one -one ratio, neat or in solution. And if you put that amida compound on the hydrogen gas, you regenerate your catalyst. So we proposed this mechanism in 2001, and uh, 
there have been several papers subsequently that essentially attest to this mechanism. So this was very, you know, good for us. Uh, the amida compound, we were not able to isolate it and, well, we we're not able to get a crystal structure of it for the bionic compound, the diphosphine compound, but we we're able to do that for the uh, triphenylphosphine compound. And so this is a well-defined crystal structure for the amida compound. Or we make it, we make the dihydride, you put it on the vacuum, you remove hydrogen, you get an amido, which you put back on the hydrogen, you can regenerate the dihydride. So this is a clear indication that this system the, this interaction, this hydrogen bond that we started studying was not just simply a real electrostatic bond, it also has its reactivity properties. So after my stint at the uh, University of Toronto, I was at Wilfrid Laurier University where we developed some new ligands, uh, amino diphosphine system I spoke about, I, did a, uh, I discussed some of that work yesterday. Uh, but in 2004, I decided to set up a company. The name of the company was Kanata Chemical Technologies. And the objective then was to essentially commercialize the technologies I've developed. Uh, by now of the rights of ownership of the technology, so with fragrance, with, with Firmness, we reach an agreement where they have the right of use for fragrance and flavors. I have the right for everything else, including pharmaceutical application. Uh, Wilfred Laurier University, I was able to get all the rights for, for that technology. So we started up this company. The focus would be to develop an apply these catalysts for pharmaceutical, fragrance, flavor, and agrochemical, and, and even energy applications. However, the focus is on pharma. And why? The main reason is that the pharma is the most profitable of all the chemical industries. Not only that, the global pharma industry in uh, 2004, when I set up this company, was approaching a trillion dollars globally, both branded and generic. So, you know, we just want a tiny percentage of this. 0 0.01 would be fine. <laughs> Now, at the time, however, it turns out that there was really limited use of catalyst technologies in pharma. There was a lot of use of palladium and heterogeneous metals, but there was very limited applications of homogeneous catalysts. So at the time, the market, however, was dominated by the branded companies. However, the generic pharmaceutical companies were now emerging. and. There was a very important, this was a very important time to actually get into this business because there was a lot of branded companies and pharmaceutical uh, products which are now approaching what is called a patent cliff. So there were blockbusters like Zocor, there was uh, Lipitor and you know, so on. They were going to lose patent protection. These, com these products were selling you know, tens of billions of dollars per year. So you, you could just imagine the crisis the big pharma companies were in. You know, they, you know, you know, so they have a crisis, we see an opportunity. And so, so so we jump in, and of course we we want to um, you know to play both sides of this coin. We want to help the branded pharmaceutical companies, and of course we also want to help the generic pharmaceutical companies. So we developed two value prop value proposition. So proposition for the branded company is that listen, our catalyst can ensure that you have more efficient manufacturing. We have chiral catalysts, so you can make chiral precursors, chiral intermediates, even your chiral API. This is green chemistry, so there are incentives and tax credits. So, for example, in Ontario, by using a chiral technology or any green technology, you will now have access to incentives and even certain tax credits. Uh, you'll now be able to limit use and even certain types of solvents. You can recover your precious metal waste. In fact, companies like Johnson, Matty, and Numico will actually buy your waste from you. So, you know, very good value proposition. And more important, we make sure we drive this point home. The catalyst technology now will help to limit and delay the generic competition after the patent expires. And we have a value proposition for the generic companies as well. You get high quality products at low cost. This is the most important thing for a generic company. That's all they want to see. If you don't, if you can't do this, then they don't care about anything else. Uh, the catalyst technology to accelerate the product development and regulatory filings, especially what is called the under filings, the abbrevi abbreviated new drug applications. So for a pharmaceutical company, uh, they have their, they have to get their, you know, approval. If they approval, now for a generic company who is going to put this product on the market, you don't have to do the clinical trial all over. You can use the regulatory information from the branded product and just demonstrate that your product have the same purity, same quality, and even the, sa and even the same biosimilarity. And so you, in this set, you, f you file what is called an abbreviated new, uh, new drug application to put your pharmaceutical, your generic product on the market. Now, if you're the first company to get your ANDA approved, then you also have 180 days exclusivity in the U.S. That's six months. Now, 
What this means is that within that six month period, you can collect all the profit. More, in fact, you'll collect more profit of that drug than you'll collect for the rest of the life of your, part, of your product. So this 180 exclusivity means a lot for a, a generic pharmaceutical company. And of course, it ensures that you secure your market share. So generic companies, they're not trying to capture all the world. They know what market share they're going after in Canada, and the US, in Brazil. They're just, so you want to sell it, so we'll help you to just get your market share. If you get some more, that's a bonus. And of course, the most important point for us we drive on the fact that you can now drive the branded company out of the market and keep your competitors off the base. So, as I said, for a value proposition, we try to play both sides. So, at the time, we have technologies. We have the aminophosphine technology. Like, for example, we have the aminophosphine PN system. We have aminodiphosphine. We have the tetradentate diaminodiphosphine system. Some of the ligands are shown here. Uh, we have chiral aminophosphines and even aminodiphosphines as well. And you can bind them to different metals, ruthenium, rhodium, iridium. So it depends on what activity, selectivity you desire, you can make your catalyst. Uh, we also wanted some diphosphine, but you know, this was, you know, we really want to get down to make some money. So rather than going and reinvent the wheel, we actually approached DuPont and licensed their diphosphine technology, which is called the phospholanes. So they have DuPont, BPE, ferrocene. Uh, the, the procedures in DuPont's patent for these were lousy, but they licensed to us at anyway, you know, and we have to pay them every year. And they said, listen, good luck, go and figure out how to make it and sell it, which we did. In fact, we, our process for these phospholanes was so good that we had we, all the distributors switch to, like for example, Sigma Aldrich, uh, Fisher, uh, Strem Chemicals, actually switch from Chiratech that used to supply these phospholanes and actually buy from us, all right? The key for us to make these products was actually water. When we make these products, they actually, you know, the final step, you get the salt, which is potassium uh, you know, sulfate, actually comes out of solution as a gelatinous material. Everybody else tried to filter it. We just pour water into it and wash away the salt, and then distill our product or crystallize it. So we're able to get, you know, jump on that. And we kept that a secret. In fact, this is the very first time I'm actually revealing that. And that's how we kept everybody else at bay. Now, based on the, info, the, the reaction you intend, what you want to do with these catalysts, you could use rhodium, ruthenium, palladium, even copper for amination, uh, hydrogenation, as the case may be. So we also have now these, this valuable class of phospholine ligands. So okay, we're now ready to go to the pharmaceutical company and make the pitch. And of course, you know, if we're talking to a branded or a generic company, we have to remember and stick to the script of our value proposition. So we approach Apotex. Now Apotex was and still is Canada's largest generic pharmaceutical company. They do a lot of R&D across Canada and other countries. However, we found that they are limited to catalyst technologies, especially homogeneous catalysts. It's almost non-existent, unbelievable. Now, we made a very good pitch to Apotex and they told us, well, they don't do business with companies less than five years old. So we tell them about all the times, you know, all the stuff we have done, all the publications, the patents, Ferminish. They said, come back after five or six years. And so that was really a wake up call, all right? So, well, we decided to approach the branded companies. And, but at the same time, well, we want to see what was really happening in the branded world. And so there was, at this time, there was a, a, you know, a lot of activity going on. There was uh, F Pfizer, which was the largest pharmaceutical company in the world, was developing this product called Lyrica. It was approved for neuropathic pain. It's the first medicine approved by the FDA for fibromyalgia. And so th this product was expected to be launched shortly. So there are a lot of companies, a lot of contract research organization was actively developing the process. It was a highly anticipated blockbuster. In other words, whichever company was able to solve Pfizer's problem to manufacture this product, it would be like winning the lottery. All right, we wanted to jump in, but before we could, Chirotech, that's basically a spin-off from, uh, from, from the University of Cambridge, uh, which now was Dow Pharma. So Dow was now jumping into the pharma business because of the value. Dow is a, at the time was the world's second largest from a, a chemical company. They actually, so Dow Pharma came up with a new technology. At, they actually received a contract from Pfizer for the development of a catalytic process for Lyrica, and they successfully developed this technology. It was based on a phospholine technology. So at the time, the only three companies with a license from DuPont, it was Canate Chemical Technologies, Chirotech, 
and Shem Chemicals. Only two companies were producing the fossil in Ligon, and it was Kanata Chemical Technologies and Kyrotech. And Kyrotech, literally, in, all, in the eyes of everyone, they won the lottery. They were able to make, uh, develop a very efficient process to make Lyrica using uh, a, a, a rhodium defos, methyl defos catalyst. Now, they offered their technology to Pfizer, and Pfizer rejected. They said it's too expensive. And so what Pfizer did, they developed their own technology for Lyrica. It's based on the ligand that was developed at Pfizer, and it's called Chai Chicken Foot Foss. So essentially, uh, Pfizer was able to show, show that Chai Chicken Foot Foss was superior to Kyrotex phosphorylene technology. All right? And in fact, Lyrica was launched in 2005 using Chai Chicken Foot Foss. So this is the structure of the Rhodium Chai Chicken Foot Foss uh, catalyst. I have no idea why they call it that. <laughs> <laughs> now, and true to fact, I mean, the sales exceeded $1 billion by 2006. So in less than one year, sales of Lyrica was more than a $1 billion. It's now more than $5 billion per year. Now, why I'm referring to this in relation to us even trying to approach the branded company, because this is a lesson for all of us. Now, remember who is behind Kyrotech? It was Dow, the world's second largest company. Their sales was on par with Pfizer. So this would be like a match made in heaven, two big boys dominating the pharma industry. But think about it. When a product is a blockbuster, that is a billion of sales or more per year, it means it's millions of dollars per day. The big pharma company, they're not going to play ball with their technology. They cannot afford to lose one day of production. They prefer to control it themselves, even if they have to use trife chicken foot fuss. All right? And so, you know what? We, this was a lesson. And we, we, we the, you know, Dow got the beating, but we got the lesson. So we decided, you know, we're going to take Apotex advice and we're going to wait. So we decided, OK, you know what? You know, we're going to be another couple of years before we can go back to these generic companies and, and make our case. But in the meanwhile, we develop our you know, library of ligands and catalysts. We start selling them through distributors. We also evaluate the technologies to make a variety of chiral products, mostly products which are going to be, uh, be used either as precursors or end products for pharmaceutical applications. And the focus was on the pending generic blockbusters, so products in sales with excess of a billion dollars. I don't think we look at anything under five billion in sales. The more the merrier. We just want a tiny percentage. One such product was Lipitor. So this was slated to become generic in 2010, 2011 in Canada and Europe, 2011 USA. Now this is a top selling pharmaceutical product of all times. 14 billion in sales in 2008. All right. So we want a piece of this. Everybody, the, you know, the brand, the, the 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 nickname for this product at the conferences and the trade shows was Turbostatin. Everybody want a piece of Turbostatin, and uh, this is a key step in making Lipitor. You need to make this chiral alcohol from this ketone. Now, the process we develop uses this catalyst. It's called a PFOS. Catalyst is actually a Johnson Matic product. We screen everything. So when we are looking at a screening, when we are looking for effective technology, we look at our own. We also look at those of our competitors. We look at others which are just available for free. The reason is that we want to go to a client with the best technology. If it happens to be with another company, then we say, you know what, it's better to partner with them or to license from them rather than going with an inferior technology to the client. We want to provide the best uh, bang for the buck. And of course, you want to get the contract, even if it means you have to share it with somebody. So this technology, this catalyst was very effective. We could make the chiral alcohol very high. Uh, we, you know, I think it was like 98% uh, yield and about 97% uh, EEs. It was very good. The problem with this compound is that because of these pyridyl rings, it also facilitates some dehydrochlorination. So you end up with this chiral epoxide. This is a byproduct. And unfortunately, we're not going anywhere if this was in our uh, product stream. So the companies we're talking to, for example, uh, Pfizer, uh, Merck, uh, uh, Arch Pharma Labs, companies that were developing technologies that could actually uh, provide a solution for Pfizer, they make it very clear that there have to be none of this byproduct in it. So this was a setback for us. So what we did, we developed the PFOS system, but without those pyridine rings. And so when we developed those products, we realized that they were brand new. They've never been made before. And we give them a new name, Garfos. 
All right, so because of that setback, we were able to develop a brand new class of ligands and catalysts. And then we went back. So, you know, we not only made the phenyl compound, we also make the tall, the xyl, the BTFM, DMM, and even this bulky DTBM Garfus. All right, so this was now a new proprietary technology that came out of this setback with that uh, PFAS ligand. So we went back to the drawing board again. We took take a look at this chiral alcohol, and now we could make it without any side product. So this was very effective. So this was successful, and as you can see, this was successful using this new pH Garfus catalyst. We also take a look at another blockbuster, Montelukast. So sodium Montelukast is an active ingredient in uh, in Singulier, which is to use it. it's an oral treatment for asthma, and it's a Merck product. It became generic in 2012. So this was another blockbuster that everyone believed that there was some opportunity. The reason why is that the, the key ingredient is this chiral alcohol. The problem is that there wasn't a lot of good methods of making it. Now. The current process, the process which was current at the time, they use a chiral stoichiometric borane reagent. It was not very effective, but it worked. The, you got, it was slow, the selectivity was moderate. You only get 95% EE, uh, that is chiral selectivity, but you know, a few recrystallization and you could get the product. So in a situation like this, the pharma company will go with what worked. Now, Merck also had its own biocatalytic process, but it was expensive. They had to use a substrate to enzyme ratio of 25 to 1 weight per, for weight. So, so it worked very well, but it was not very good. It was slightly better than the cardiboring reagent. Now, this is the alternative product uh, technology we developed. So we, you, we developed this catalyst. So it's, it's now a xyl, one of our xyl garfos with a chiral diamine um, dipen. And it was cationic. We make it cationic because the reaction takes place in a mixture of water and, I think, THF or water and alcohol. So we want to make sure that it was soluble in water. So we make it a cationic catalyst. And it worked very well. You're looking at a substrate catalyst ratio of 2,000 to 1. Uh, our crude product was 99% purity and 99% EE. It's far superior than both the Merck product as well as the stoichiometric region. How good it was, now we have a branded company at the table with us. All right, so Merck was talking to us about this technology. So is Teva, that is the world's largest uh, general company at the time, and TNU, which is just a Chinese manufacturer. Now, we eventually reached a deal with Teva where we could actually send them our catalyst and they now were testing it in their manufacturing facility. The problem is that once you activate the catalyst, you get a, you get a very reactive and air sensitive dihydride compound. And unfortunately, Teva was not able to sort out, you know, was not able to handle it. So after about 10 tries, they gave up. And so we had to work out an alternative means for them to get this technology. I won't go into that details, but what I want to point out was that, you know, you could have a very good technology. You could get it to your client, and they may not be able to use it because they may not have the skills, they may not have the equipment, and they're not going to waste their time trying to figure it out. So this was also a lesson to us that we actually take note of for any future uh, interactions where we need to make sure that we have a stable catalyst. Now in 20... Yeah. Now in, in, in 2010, we finally got a seat at the table with Apotex. So our five, year, our five years was up. <laughs> now they were willing to talk to us. And they like what we had to offer. Now the problem is that they had some regulatory filings, uh, well, some regulatory issues with the US. Their products was now banned from going into the US until they fixed that. They were only able to do that two years later. So we had to wait another two years. But by 2012, Apotex was now ready to talk to us. And in fact, they, they were in a desperate situation. They were working on this process. It, it's a catalytic process to make citagliptin, which is a which is an active ingredient in Januvia. It's a Merck product, and it's a treat type 2 diabetes. Now, they were working on this for five years with no success. They want to have a drug master file by 2013. They want to do some commercial production by 2015. So even though this product is going to be generic in 2020 in Canada and 2022 in the US, this is how far back these companies are working on the process. All right, so that's something also to bear in mind. So we got the discussion going with, with, with Apotex. Uh, we signed a contract in September 2012. And by November 2012, we complete the process, and we gave them a technology transfer package, all right? The crude product was greater than 
chemical and chiral purity. Now what is interesting here, while these guys were struggling with the technology, they were not willing to talk to us. We fixed it in three months. All right? And so the development work was completed in Branford, and it's, late, it's now slated for production in Mexico. They are, they are looking to produce 60 tons per year. And this product sells for $2,000 per kilogram. So it's a very valuable product for Apotex. Now, just as we finished the Apotex project, which was November 2012, we were approached by Teva in December 2012. So in Jamaica, we have a saying that when it rains, it pours. So here's another opportunity. Now, Teva already had a process, but they don't believe it was good enough because other companies now want to develop catalytic process because the, the originator company, Merck, had a catalytic process. And Teva want to make sure that when they go to market, they have a very good process. So they came to us, we also had some discussions. We started working on the project, and we finished this in April 2013. Same thing, 99.9% .9 chemical and chiral purity. The development work actually started in Petah Tikva, Israel. And their target, they are bigger than Apotex, is 120 tons per year. But I want to draw your attention to the catalyst. This catalyst we developed specifically for Teva because we don't know who, which group they are going to give it to. The last time we sent them a catalyst, they lost all of it because they couldn't handle it. Once they activated, it was dead and with no product. So we make sure that this catalyst, which was designed to be robust. How robust this is? This is shelf stable and air stable. And when we're setting up the reaction, we open up the pressure reactor, take the cover off, then we pour in the catalyst, we pour in the additive, we pour in the substrate, we even pour in the solvent, and then we close it up. Then we degas it, pressurize it with hydrogen, set up the temperature, and we get 99.9% .9 chemical and chiral purity. So this was a very good lesson we learned before, and we actually you know, bring it to bear the second time around. We also, so by January 2013, did I say when it rained, it pours? We are now in discussion with Cambrex. They actually was, by August of 2013, they have to take this process to market. There are, are two catalytic, there are two products here, hydromorphone, hydrocodone, that they have to produce. Uh, it's a catalytic isomerization process. These are the, the ligand and the catalyst precursor they have to use. The problem is that they were not able to make the ligand and the catalyst on any scale, all right? now. So they came to us, and you know, I won't go into all the details here, but suffice it to say, we're able to develop process to make these, both the ligand and the catalyst. And so by uh, about May 2013, we have a contract with, uh, with Cambrex for supplying both uh, the ligand and the catalyst precursor for them to make hydrocodone and hydromorphone. So this was our standing in 2013. We have commercial supply contracts for ligands and catalysts, through, for distributors, for pharmaceutical companies, several other contracts were in the industry. You know, we're now looking at revenues of about $25 million US per year. But at the same time, you know, we were now seen as a takeover target. In fact, we had discussions with Apotex for, uh, for a merger and acquisition, same thing with John Samati. Uh, but eventually, the company was bought by one of our existing investors. And unfortunately for him and for all of us, he lost all the contracts before the end of the year. So this happened in, in August 2013. And by September 2013, we start up a new company. So we went back to what we're doing. Now we're still developing Catalyst, um, you know, for pharmaceutical, and the focus now, and it's the name of the company, the focus was on pharmaceutical applications. And we also want to extend this to stable isotope products, in other words, uh, deuterium products for pharmaceutical application. Now, here I want to now introduce deuterium, and well, why deuterium in pharmaceutical applications? Now we all know deuterium as heavy hydrogen, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a stable isotope. The other thing by, you know, which is important is that deuterium is a high-value product. For those of you who have to use deuter deuterated solvents every day, the value of those products is because of the deuterium. So deuterium, D2 gas, uh, actually costs between $1,500 to $2,000 per kilogram. So anything that contains deuterium is considered a high-value product. Now, right now, deuterated pharmaceuticals are being developed as some of the next generation products. So we went through the phase of those blockbusters and the mega blockbusters. Now there's a phase of 
generic, oh, sorry, of, of branded deuterated pharmaceutical products coming on the market. It has been shown that these deuterated products, depending on their, you know, and, and, and where in the molecule the deuterium is, it actually improves effectiveness, safety, and tolerability. All right? Now, so since 2015, we have been working on developing homogeneous catalysts that are effective for deuteration using either deuterium gas or D2O, that is heavy water, to deuterate a variety of chemical products. Now the catalysts we develop, they are A-stable, shelf-stable, and so it's also part of the lesson we learned in our you know, previous uh, life uh, that you know, we want to facilitate safety, handling, storage, and ensure that they are commercialized. So we don't want to be in a situation where the, cat, where the, the client mishandles it and then we lose an opportunity because it's too sensitive. And so this is an example of some of the deuteration work we do. So like, for example, diethylene glycol, we can use our catalyst and just deuterium gas and we can actually fully deuterate it, all right? So we can go from, uh, so the reaction is very mild, 140 degrees centigrade, 10 atmosphere uh, deuterium pressure. We can use a neat substrate and get neat product. We can filter by uh, filtering through silica gel or by distillation. Now these deuterated uh, diethylene in glycol can be transformed into a variety of product. The other thing we can do with these with this with these catalysts is selective deuteration. So, for example, the same diethylene glycol, we can actually deuterate the terminal CH bonds, leave the internal in, intact. With other catalysts, we can actually deuterate the internal and keep the terminal intact. All right, so. This is an example of, depending on what the client needs, we can bring that to bear. And in this case, for even for these selective deuteration, we're still looking at uh, need substrate going to need products and, and purification by filtration or distillation. Now what you can do with, uh, with these deuterated diethylene glycols, you can make a variety of uh, products. For example, you can convert to deut deuterated morpholine, N-methyl morpholine, or even dioxin. And you can do the same even with the partially deuterated. So imagine that. You can now make morpholine, which is now selectively deuterated depending on what the application is. So this is, you know, so the good thing about this is that with the demand for deuterium products coming on the market, we have the technology that we can make a variety of these products. We can do arenes, we can do uh, alkanes, we can do, you know, uh, you know, compounds like these. So, you know, it, it put us in a very good uh, standing where deuterium is concerned. Now, in April 2017, so just over a year and a half ago, the first deuterated pharmaceutical product was approved, all right? So this product um, is called deutetrabenazine. It's a Teva product. It's actually derived from tetrabenazine, which has been around from the 1950s. So it's as generic as generic could be. But by just simply sticking some deuterium on it, and of course, all the clinical trials were done, the approvals are now in place, this is now projected to become a blockbuster, all right? Now, it was first, it, it, it is the first deuterium pharmaceutical product to be approved, but what's even important, there are several other products with incorporating deuterium which are being developed. And, as I, and what was important here is that the deuterium is actually derived from deuterated methanol, okay? Now, in terms of that, there's now a lot of quests for the production of deuterated methanol. The existing process to make deuterated methanol has been around from the 1950s and 1960s. Essentially, it's carbon monoxide gas with a heterogeneous catalyst and deuterium gas. Only two companies actually produce deuterated methanol. So we actually have an uphill battle when we said, okay, you know what, we're going to see if our catalyst can do the trick. And so, yes, we actually develop a process, you know, for, I cannot disclose what this is, but it's a carbon dioxide <laughs> derivative. With deuterium gas or catalyst, we actually make deuterated methanol. And we're doing this under very mild conditions. All right, so, you know, uh, our substrate is here stable, the catalyst is here stable. Our reaction conditions is 80 to 120 degrees and 30 atmosphere of deuterium gas. Now, we can separate the deuterium, sorry, the deuterated methanol from our byproduct by just simply distillation, all right? So it's a very high boiling point difference between the methanol and uh, our byproduct. And what we do with our byproduct? Well, we convert it back to our starting material, and in the process, we get another, another byproduct, which happens to be deuterated chloroform, okay? So the byproduct, as I said, is converted to uh, deuterated chloroform. We regenerate our starting material for deuterated methanol. The catalyst is here stable. Distillation process is stable. The revenue from the deuterated chloroform actually pay for the entire process. In other words, 
or deuterated methanol as a negative cost. And with the deuterated methanol, and you trade the chloroform, so we now have commercial opportunities. We can make these on any scale. The desirable product is also deuterated methyl iodide. So we're in the process of actually making this on a commercial scale. Now, what I want to point out here is that these, this, so the first deuterated product to be approved is deutetrabenazine. It was approved in 2017. It's a treatment for chorea associated with the Huntington's disease. But there's deuterated dextromethorphan. Okay, it's in phase three, advanced stage. This is, this is actually expected to be um, to be approved, and then there's another company here that's actually now phase two. So I'm just pointing these out. There are lots of others. Okay, they are at various stages of approval process. But what I want to point out more than anything else is the fact that if you look at these compounds, these all derive from deuterated methanol or deuterated methyl iodide. So there's a lot of demand for this product. There are only two manufacturers, and we want to be the third. So at this stage, I just want to just kind of, uh, you, know, uh, and, you know, just entertain what is, what is now going on in the pharma industry. So deutetrabenazine, as I said, it was approved in 2017. It's a, it's, it's a branded product. Now, what is happening in the pharmaceutical industry is that most branded pharmaceutical companies now have a generic division or partner. And the reason for this is that with the patent cliff, a lot of companies learn a very hard lesson. Pfizer was looking, well, they lost a lot of money, $14 billion per year, and all of that was with just one product, Lipitor. All of that was gone within about two to three years of generic. They actually were still pushing branded Lipitor, but, you know, people went for the cheaper atorvastatin generics, which was essentially the same compound. And so it's a lot of losses for them. So most branded company now have a generic division or partner, all right? And they do this so that even after they lose their patent rights, they still can get some revenue from that product and piggybacking on the brand that they build up over the years. Now, Teva is the world's largest generic pharmaceutical company. In 2015, Teva purchased Aspect Pharmaceutical for $3.5 billion. Aspects was a company that developed deutetrabenazine. So they bought Aspects, they not only get deutetrabenazine, but they have the entire portfolio of deuterated products that Aspects was developing. Now, as I said, deutetrabenazine was approved in 2017. It's a Teva branded product. It's called, the brand name is Ostedo. Uh, this product will become generic in 2024. All right. Now, several other generic developments are actually underway for this product. So even though it's, you know, it has been on the market for uh, a year and a half, companies are already developing their means of actually getting access to the generic product. In fact, companies have actually a process. They want deuterated methanol or methyl iodide, as well as other deuterated products because there are lots of other products that don't, that use other deuterated uh, compounds. So at this stage, I just want to, to summarize that you know, we are able to do what we, you know, what we did because of our capabilities, our capabilities and catalysts, especially in relation to pharmaceutical and fine chemical uh, manufacturing. Our catalysts and processes, they are cost effective, efficient, they are em environmentally friendly. And these catalyst technologies allow us to be competitive supplier of pharmaceutical products, uh, fine chemical products, and, and, and now, more and more recently, stable isotope products. And, uh, Another, and the market is global, all right? So we are a local Canadian company, but we supply products to companies all over the world. Uh, one thing I should point out, we, in, with Kanata Chemical uh, Technologies, we supplied over 300 products through the Strem Chemicals and Sigma Aldrich. Uh, we still supply most of those products, even through Kamal Pharma Chem. And so this is something which will be on, ongoing as well. So in addition to the pharmaceutical side of things, we also distribute these, these products. So you want to acknowledge uh, the, the folks who have contributed to this work. So these are the employees at uh, both uh, over, you know, over the uh, past what, 14 years at Kanata Chemical Technologies and now with Kamal Pharma Chem. They have contributed in you know, a variety of ways and capacities. In fact, all except one, a chemist, 
So they have all, you know, so pretty much, I mean, they have been significant contribution. And I also want to acknowledge and, and really thank the, uni, the, sorry, the UWI Mona Catalyst Research Group. Uh, the group is headed by Professor Das Gupta, Professor Paul Mirage, and uh, individuals in this group have actually, their focus is on some of the fundamental chemistry that, uh, that I'm, I'm discussing here today, and work is ongoing. And so, you know, it may just look, uh, you know, some of this work may just be taken for granted, but I just want to point out that I actually started looking at hydrogen bonding. All right, so I want to thank you for your attention. You can do both. Yes. So you can use the same catalyst, but by modifying the conditions, you can get internal and uh, and terminal deuteration. These are ruthenium and iridium-based. <laughs> yes, they are ruthenium and iridium-based systems. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Many, many pharmaceuticals yeah. incorporate fluorine, and fluorination is hard. Yeah. So, you know, that's a very good question. In fact, there is a company called Florinov, and if you look at it, uh, the founder was Malik Slassi. He was, we were actually in the same building, the Mars Center in Toronto. His specialization was to put fluorine at different points, just the same way they are now putting deuterium in these pharmaceutical products. So most of these products will be approved because they are existing products which the clinical trials have already been done. So essentially once they put in the deuterium, it's, it's not the same as putting a generic product on the market, but they don't have to go through all the, uh, the gory clinical trials as putting a product on the market for the first time. So they, you know, they have to be safety, they have to be efficacy, and other regulatory filings. Now what Malik did was pretty much the same thing. He developed these compounds and he essentially put fluorine at selected positions and looked at the activity and selectivity. And the fluorine actually impact uh, significant properties, like for example, tolerability, uh, you know, reduces isomerization and so on. And the recent and one of the most significant compounds he developed, it was shown to be more effective, far more effective than the parent comp compound for uh, for cancer treatment. In fact, his company was bought for $35 million. He got $10 million up front. And at the time it was just a company of two people. It may be possible, but I've not looked at that yet. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> so I can do yeah. So I was wondering what property of the ruthenium that mm -hmm. results in such a you know, wonderful behavior, you know, part to be called a bomb, you know, what is it about this metal that mm -hmm. results in such a you know, uh, wonderful behavior? It's a hydrogen bond. The 
hydrogen. The hydrogen bond. So you get the yeah, so you get the, the what is called the bifunctional activity because you have the if you notice most of these catalysts have a diamine or a NH group on it, and that NH group will actually interact with the hydride once it's generated. Now it's not in all cases, like for example, the catalyst for carbon carbon double bonds, none of those are really have the bifunctionality. But for all the for most of the ketones it means uh, those have that bifunctionality. And that's what matters. In fact even the iridium system work as well because of that bifunctionality. That's interesting. I uh, also had a question about the hydrogen bond. Yes. Bond. Yes. What is the distance that you know, defines them and uh, <coughs> Yeah. yeah, so the Van der Waal distance, uh, if it's just say, just, uh, stru just say, you know, structural as opposed to electrostatic interaction is 2.4. That's sort of used as the um, guideline. Uh, some of these interactions is down to like 1.8, 2.2. So for example, the rutinium, this, the, the, the rutinium dihydride that I said spontaneously lose hydrogen, the uh, the x-ray distance between the hydride and the proton is 2.2 angstrom and it's actually spontaneously losing hydrogen. That's interesting. So did you think to use them as sensors for hydrogen in your house? Did you have that color chain? No, we haven't, but we have actually used similar technology for chemical hydrogen storage. And we have a technology which is actually being um, commercialized as we speak in the UK for where we use ammonia boring as our hydrogen storage material and we can essentially uh, liberate quantitative amounts of hydrogen from the material. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> now, I, I'll speak for them. Just wondering, uh, what, what would you say would be the greatest limitation to um, for example, this catalytic system that does the, uh, these catalytic systems that exhibit that non-classical hydrogen bonding. Uh, what do you mean greatest limitation? In terms of their activity, um, I'm sure their, their inherent properties uh, will impact on ultimately what the reaction outcomes are, but in terms of their ability to withstand, I don't know, elevated temperatures, I don't know if their solubilities are issues. Um, do they exhibit any limitations from yeah, what so, you yes. have so, yeah, And that's a very good question. There are limitations depending on the application. So most of the rutinium catalysts uh, that I've outlined here, they are routine, once you activate, well, they are rutinium two to start with. Once they're activated, they're still rutinium two. Um, rut rut rutinium two. So essentially, I've just exchanged chloride for hydride. Other compounds are rutinium four. But once they're exposed to air, you get rutinium three. And that's the end of it and there's nothing you can do, you cannot resuscitate it. On the other hand, for the iridium system, the stable oxidation state for this system is iridium-3. So you'll get even trihydrides. Now the chloride uh, containing iridium compounds are even more stable than the rutinium. Some of those catalysts we even could heat up to 120 degrees for 30 days in air and they're still stable. However, when the iridium system is activated, you get iridium trihydride, so essentially exchange the hydrogen, so they, sorry, the chloride for hydro hydrogen. And they're also air sensitive. They oxidize, you go from uh, iridium uh, 3 to iridium 5. However, those are uh, have a different attribute than the rutinium system. If you put those in a reducing medium, then they go right back to uh, iridium-3 and they're ready to do their thing again. So the rutinium, as I said, the limitation is that they will go to rutinium-3 and that's the end. The iridium can go to 5, it can bring it back down to 3. All right, and so that's just in relation to the, um, the, the that's a limitation in terms of the, the oxidation states. Uh, in terms of activity, well, we usually do screening because sometimes the interest is not turnover. It may be selectivity. And so it's just a matter of what the, the desired outcome is. So, you know, you, you, you set up your screening accordingly and you'll choose a product depending on what the, um, and, and what the desired outcome is. And, and just one you know, more thing I want to mention, there was a product from Ferminish that they didn't want cis, they didn't want a trans product, they want a 60 to 40 mixture of cis and trans. 
I've never seen anything like that, but that's what the client want and that's what they got. Which one? In, in this deuteration, no, the, uh, the diethylene glycol deuteration. Yes. Uh, have you... They said it all... No, the slide that you had up before. The, yes, that one. Yeah. Uh, have you explored the scope or the limitations of that process beyond? Uh, well, what we have done, we have done both all the well, we have done the full deuteration, the selective deuteration, and we have made the subsequent products. Right. The glycol, as like other substrates, we have looked at ethanol. We have looked at uh, well, right now we have even looked at sodium borohydride. Okay. So we can make um, we can use sodium borohydride and convert it to sodium borohydride using a catalyst and deuterium gas. So we can do even a salt. Yes, we're actually making that product as we speak. <laughs> Are there any other questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen? If not, we are going to ask uh, our cast member to uh, present Carl with a token of appreciation for his uh, Thank you very much participation for a wonderful sure. presentation uh, I'm Dr. Begara uh, Thank you so delightful this, lecture. Is a, this is a small token of appreciation on behalf of guys Thank you very much Thank you Appreciate it Thank you